very good to see all of you here today. I sound like the great and wonderful Oz, don't I? Ignore that man behind you. There we go. Don't ignore that man. It's the one behind the curtain. I want you to just uh, take note of some announcements. You have your bulletins. You got all kinds of neat interesting information in there. And uh, I, I want to publicly go on record as saying thank you to you as a church family for how you just come together and when there's a crisis or a need, you're obedient to God's leading. And that is so wonderful to see the church pull together like that and do what needs to be done. Uh, it's that whole concept of having your relationship with God in such a way that you hear Him when He talks to you, and He doesn't really talk, talk to you, but when He leads you and guides you, and then you say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. So I just want to affirm you in that, and you never know what God's going to ask you to do. So just be ready to say yes. Uh, this next Sunday, you got your bulletins, get a paper, get a, yeah, this is a paper, thank you. Get a pencil or a pen, and write down what you're supposed to bring. And if your name is R through Z, and it says bring a main course, your last name, R through Z, it says bring a main course, you say, I just don't do main courses, but I do dessert. Well, find, you know, Heather Quimby. That's a cue. And say, Heather, would you do the main course at all? I'm just picking on her. You know, would you do the main course at all? You know, you can switch it around, but this is just some guidelines, okay? Kind of like the pirates. You know, the rules are just kind of guidelines. They're not meant to be kept. Anyway, but you, you can work your way through this one. And uh, we're looking forward to this next Sunday. Next Sunday is uh, our communion family care fund, which reminds me, if any of you have some funds that you wanted to donate uh, towards the Winslow uh, benefit and were not able to do so yesterday, Ron, would you raise your hand, please? Just get the funds to Ron, and he'll take care of that, and they'll get to where they need to be. Okay? Next. Wow. Ladies, uh, you're going to uh, be talking and studying about Crazy Love, a uh, study by Francis Chan. And uh, right now we have a short uh, video that I'd like for us to observe. And then we'll move on from there. Crazy love, but one of my concerns is that sometimes we'll, we'll read a book like that and get this idea, like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna live for Jesus and forget everyone else, no one else is doing it. And, and I, I tend to have this tendency where I just go, okay, I'm just gonna do this by myself and follow Jesus. But if you read the Bible, you see that God really doesn't want us to live that way, He really wants us to live with other people and to live in community with other people. And that's the whole point of this DVD curriculum. It's this idea of let's get some believers together in groups where we just commit to live this out and care for one another the way the Bible calls us to. And, and, and another thing that we're notorious for as Christians is we'll have these experiences at Christian meetings or in churches or conferences and, and we'll get so close to God but then Monday comes or, or the real world comes. And so what we did was we shot this in the context of an ordinary day. Like, how do I take my ordinary, average day and make it something that's supernatural where I'm madly in love with God and thinking about Him all day long? And, and my prayer is that through this curriculum, there'll be groups of believers that get together everywhere, just come in together and say, you know, we're going to live this way. We're going to do this together. for this and some stuff like that. Then next Monday night, in earnest, you'll be leading, you'll be studying us together. 
and uh, Erica Pierce will be leading the study with the ladies group. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward even more to hearing us give praise and worship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for being with us this morning. Let's we'll stand as we uh, praise God together. And uh, we'll start with a word of prayer as we get started this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. And I just praise you for each one that's gathered here together, together today. And may uh, the words that we speak, Lord, be a blessing to you. And uh, Lord, may each one be here blessed today by our celebrating you and your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Surpassing greatness, and I thought of that, and I thought about whatever is 
great, and then God is surpassing that. And what an amazing thing that is. Hard to even grab, you know, kind of grasp or put our minds around. But the beauty is we don't have to put our minds around. Really. We just trust that. Praise Him this morning. Joy comes in the morning. Not friends, uh, we think of this earthly 
complain, but I, I like to think of it, take the very best qualities and aspects of having the, the greatest friend, closest friend to you, and that's what we're talking about here, having a closeness and a personal relationship with the God who created us, and that's what we're talking about. Who am I that you're mindful of me, Lord? <laughs>
in worship that are directly to God and, and are really just our words to Him. And then there are songs that we sing about God, and that has moments where it's both. And we are singing about who we are in Christ. And then as we sing in that, in the last part, you know, you call me, friend. We're singing that to the Lord above. Here we have this one, Mighty to Save, in much the same way that we have moments where we're singing about what we have through Christ. But He hears our words, and He is pleased with us as we declare the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. Everyone needs compassion. Father, Lord, I thank you that we are your like here. 
Father, on this earth. Until your return, we have a task before us, Lord. And I thank you that you pour out upon those who call up to you all those great blessings, your compassion, your mercy, everything falls upon me, Lord, when I come to the throne of grace. Lord, I thank you that your grace is sufficient, that it is enough for me. There's nothing more I need to do than to submit to you, Father. Surrender my life to you, Father. I thank you for those promises. I thank you for how you do provide and how you bless, even as we take our time and offer you, Lord, and give to you. I recognize that it's it's really about me surrendering and putting myself aside and putting you first in the process how I will see that everybody else is first too. And you will meet my needs. You will take care of me. You will provide. Lord, you will you will make me be content and not seek after, which isn't mine anyway. Lord, I thank you. And even as we sing this last piece, I thank you.
And we thank you for each one of these young people who are here. Lord, we thank you and praise you for them. And we just thank you that you made an appointment for each one of us to be here to hear from your word today. Give us all open ears and open hearts to hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, we're back in the book of Romans. Did anybody miss it? Oh, man, i got to do something different here. We are looking today at Romans chapter 14, so go ahead and take your Bibles and turn there if you're not there already. And we're looking at the weak and the strong. Okay? And there's oftentimes a lot of confusion about who the weak person is and who the strong person is. And we're going to be looking at that a little bit more specifically today. Now, as you read through this passage, you're going to find a whole bunch of contrasts, aren't you? You're going to be seeing, you know, you look up here, we think black and white. That's a contrast, night and day. Uh, you look at the Google Mail versus the envelope mail system. You've got horse and rider next to a highway where they would have the horseless carriage, if you will. The telephone, and I, I, how many of you remember that type of telephone? <laughs> yeah. Some of you are saying they actually had telephones with dials on them. <laughs> Versus letter. How many of you have written a letter recently? It's, oh, there you go. Few of you have. That's excellent. Then you've got your contact list in your iPhone or iPad or I wish I knew where it was. <laughs> Versus your contact list in your binder. Okay? In Romans chapter 14, you've got liberalism and license on the one hand and legalism on the other hand. You've got those who are shaky in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. You've got the proud versus the paranoid. And we're going to be looking at this, especially in view of the church. Oftentimes within the church, there's a lot of extremes that can take place. In fact, we talked about some of this in Sunday school this morning. And often those extremes are usually destructive. One extreme, of course, is I can do whatever I want to. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. Okay? And the thinking and the idea behind that is if a person is saved, it really doesn't matter because... God's in the business of forgiveness, right? So I can do whatever I want. Now the other extreme is the idea of, and this other extreme has two different faces on it. One face is that large dose of paranoia. Uh, I, I just, I'm so scared of what's going to happen. Or you've got the other idea of I can do it by myself. Here the individual is either frightened about possibly doing something that might make God mad, or might make the church mad, or they feel that they have to just make certain that their salvation is secure, and the way I do that is I add this list of rules and regulations that sounds pretty spiritual, and if I keep track of all those things, well then I'm pretty sure I'm going to get into heaven. But both of those extremes will look down on the other extreme, don't they? They, they look down on them, and oftentimes believers who want to live a biblical life are looked down upon by both of those extremes as well. Either extreme is almost always destructive to the unity and harmony of Christ's church. Either extreme is very destructive. Many churches are actually destroyed or practically made ineffective by either one of these extremes, by those who promote license, do what you want, or those who promote legalism. Well, if you don't look this way, don't talk this way, don't dress this way, you can't be going to heaven. Okay? Interestingly, in my experience, working with churches that have gone through struggles, going through crisis moments, and individuals that that's all they do, go from church to church to church, to try and help struggling churches that are in the midst of fights and battles and stuff like that, License isn't usually the problem. Because it's pretty easy to point out when someone's blatantly living in sin, right? That, that's pretty obvious. What I find and what these other experts find is that legalism is often what is protected. We kind of give that one a free pass. And the reason is because it smacks of spirituality. I call it pseudo-spirituality. Pseudo meaning false. 
Okay? It's not the real McCoy, but it sure looks awfully like it. And you know, if we say that that's not right, that that's not appropriate, well, we're bordering on riling somebody up. Kind of goes back to our study we're doing in Sunday school. By the way, 9 o'clock is only an hour and a half earlier than 10.30 worship. So I'd encourage you to come to the 9 o'clock Sunday school hour. Was that subtle? <laughs> Not. Okay. We're, we're going through the Grace Awakening Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. And I'd encourage you, Cindy, to be part of it. <laughs> she has other things she's doing, but I still like to give her a hard time. So and Ashley Ann saying, what is he doing? <clears throat> Throughout history, legalism has been given a free pass. And maybe that air of righteousness. And see, that could be a form of legalism too, couldn't it? You don't come to Sunday school? Hmm. That's ridiculous. But it sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Because there's nothing wrong with Sunday school. There's nothing wrong with studying God's Word. But once we make it a criteria for a person's faith walk, well, now, understand something, that as we look at Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, Paul is not talking about blatant, outright sin. Okay? Paul's talking about preferences. He's talking about attitudes. He's, he's talking about one of Satan's subtle tools that he uses to try and destroy the church. It's, it comes from Christians who don't agree on everything about matters that aren't commanded in Scripture, nor are they forbidden in Scripture. Okay? Church pews. Show me in the Bible where church pews are required to be wooden. Likewise, show me in the Bible where they're required to look like this. Now, my wife's working on putting a spot in there that says they need to have coffee cup holders. <laughs> you know, that's, it's not in Scripture. It's a preference. It's a personal preference. So, or historic tradition, we've always done it that way before, or we've never done this before, and whenever we try to impose that on someone else who doesn't think the same way we do, you've got confusion, you've got strife, you've got ill will, you've got disharmony. Now, many of us come from a variety of backgrounds that we tend to bring with us wherever we go, whatever we do. We have something that we're comfortable and used to, okay? I love to have cereal. Strange, isn't it? And I'd be happy as a lark at 10 o'clock at night if I haven't had supper to have a bowl of cereal. That's my background. Because on the farm sometimes we come in, mom would never know or Janita would never know what time I'm going to get in the house. So I always say, a bowl of cereal is good for me. Bologna sandwich, that's great. Okay, That's my culture. Now, if you come over to our house and haven't had supper, and I offer you a bowl of cereal, you're going to think, what? Is, doesn't mean that's a breakfast food? That's breakfast, not supper. You know, well, we have different backgrounds that we bring into things. Please understand something. Diversity within a church is actually a healthy thing. There's a lot of the church growth movement that are saying you have to have what they call homogeneous church, not homogeneous, but homogeneous churches, which means everybody is the same way. In other words, everybody likes Christian rock, or everybody likes Christian rap, or everybody likes the pastor sitting on a stool and preaching that way, or everybody likes the pastor that stands up behind a pulpit so you don't see his knees shaking preaching that way. You know, what's the good of that? Do you really, like I said in such school, do you really want a bunch of little letters running around the place? That's scary. Everybody comes with their different ideas, different backgrounds, okay? Satan will use sometimes, however, that diversity within a church family to divide and conquer. Okay, for example, the open-minded believer is tempted to look upon his legalistic brother or sister as being... Too rigid, too restricted. How can they be of any use to God because they've got to have them in this little box? Okay? The legalist, on the other hand, will look at his, we'll call him a free thinking brother, okay, as well, this person's way too permissive and too undisciplined. And, you know, you can't serve Christ just by the seat of your pants. Okay? There are some people that can serve Christ way better by the seat of their pants than I can by planning it out a month or a year at a time. There's differences. 
This is the root of disunity. And Paul is going to speak to both types of Christians. Okay, one is not a pagan and one's a Christian. Please understand, he's talking to Christians who are of different mindsets. He's talking to us. To brothers. I know he's talking to the Romans here, but the principle of Scripture is for us as well. So how do you and I respond to one another when we don't see eye to eye? How do we respond to each other? What do we do with those people who differ from us and how they're to live out their faith? Because they're maybe a different place in their spiritual journey, or maybe they just see it differently. We have a friend from Meade, Kansas. His name is Lee Friesen. He's no longer there. He's working for a correctional facility. He, at one time, was involved with a very, uh, how should I say, intense motorcycle gang. Okay. He still, he's older than I am by a few years, still has very long hair, still has the tattoos, still wears the leather, and he ministers to motorcyclists and to the roughest of the rough. Okay? When some of us looked at Lee, we said, you're saved, why are you looking like that? That's where disunity comes in. If I try to say, Lee, get a haircut. Lee, get those tattoos burned off of you. Or however they do it. Okay? Lee, get a suit and a tie, for heaven's sake. How do you expect to be used by God? I'll say, don't let Satan do that to you. Don't let Satan do that to you. I believe that we're going to see, as we look at this passage, that as mature Christians, you and I should accept all other believers regardless of their place in their spiritual journey. And we're going to look at some reasons why we need to accept each other. Now, I'm not talking, I'm going to give you a disclaimer right away. And I tried to do it earlier by saying Paul's not talking about specific sins. He's not talking about a lifestyle of someone living for themselves against Christ. Okay? He's talking about believers who see things differently, who approach their spiritual walk differently because of maybe their background or where they are in their spiritual journey. We don't open armed say, it's okay, keep sinning, you know, I'm not going to hold you accountable. Because there's a whole lot of places in God's Word that Paul himself even said, if your brother is sinning, you who are spiritual, go to him, confront him, and restore such a brother with the spirit of gentleness. Galatians talks about that. First of all, Romans 14, verses 1 through 3, we're going to see that first of all, God accepts us. He says, now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not, he's not against vegetarians. We'll look at it in the context here, all right? The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For, here's the key, God has accepted him. Paul's not speaking of moral compromise. He's not speaking of doctrinal compromise. His first counsel here seems to be directed specifically to strong Christians. Why? Well, the strong Christians are stronger in their faith. They ought to get it a little bit more accurately. They ought to be able to flesh it out a little bit more accurately. He says to them, accept the one who is weak in the faith. Those who were still strongly influenced, whether it be positively or negatively, by their former religious beliefs, by the former practices. He says those are the ones that are weak in their faith because they did not understand their freedom in Christ. Okay? Historically, we shouldn't be driving the vehicle we're driving got a radio in it, which we hardly ever listen to. It's got air conditioning in it. I shouldn't be walking around with a cell phone, historically, okay? If I still hold on to those things and say, for me to be a strong Christian, I can't do this, I'm weak in my faith. See what I'm saying? I'm less of a Christian because I have air conditioning in a vehicle. I have a radio in the vehicle. That's a person who doesn't understand, understand the freedom in Christ. The word for accept is actually a compound verb. 
Uh, there's a prefix in front of it, which is a preposition that makes this verb a command. It's not just a suggestion. Paul is commanding strong believers, except without condemning or judging weaker believers. And the word for is weak. It is, it's interesting. It's an interesting word that shows that it's a temporary situation. It's a present participle. In other words, it's, it's something that you're weak right now, but with God you're going to keep growing. You're going to become stronger if you're following after Him. It's right now, while they are in this state, they are weak. And you notice I made the comment, the faith. A lot of your translations don't have the faith, but in the Greek it has the definite article, the, in front of faith. Okay? It's talking about that they're not understanding the full truth of the gospel message. Jesus says, if I set you free, you are free indeed. Okay? You're free. You're no longer bound to this old system, this old way of thinking. Paul was speaking of believers, whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles. They were weak in their understanding of their true faith in Jesus Christ. They were weak in their understanding of what it meant to live out their true faith in Jesus Christ. So what is he saying? You and I who are stronger in our faith, we need to fully, lovingly accept them, just as they are. It's like the old gospel song, God's not finished with me yet. He's still doing the work. He's still growing me. Now, we're not saying that, you know, the believer who is weak in their faith, we shouldn't talk with them about that. Yeah, we talk with them about it to help guide them. That's part of mentoring. That's part of discipling. That's part of teaching. But we don't judge them. We don't condemn them. He says it's not for the purpose of passing judgment because they genuinely hold on to these opinions very sincerely. They're weaker because they don't fully grasp it yet. They don't understand this yet. Case in point, for years I was of the opinion, early on, that it was ungodly for boys and girls, men and women, to swim together. Where did I get that? Background, tradition. There's still Bible camps today. The girls have their swim time. Out of the pool, the guys have their swim time. Okay? Does it make you a stronger or weaker Christian if you're in the swimming at the same time? For me, if I'm in the water, I need as many bodies as I can to hold me up. Okay? But that used to be part of the thinking. And you, you probably are thinking of all kinds of things from your tradition, from your history, from your background. Maybe some things right now that you're still wrestling with. Okay? We're not talking about sin. We're talking about difference of opinion. I still go back to the situation where the individual stated to the young Christian lady who had just found Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior, your salvation won't stick because it didn't come from the German Bible. Who was the weaker brother? The old man. Because he was saved from the German Bible. And he'd saved many people by preaching from the German Bible. Only people who heard the gospel in German could be saved. Now you're probably scratching your head saying, is there anybody really like that alive? Do you know you? Do you know others at least? Spiritual maturity is a growth process. Once you and I are totally spiritually mature, we're in heaven. It's not going to happen on this planet. We keep growing. We keep, Paul says, I have not yet attained. Now if Paul hadn't attained... I'm pretty certain I haven't. <laughs> and I know you're certain that I haven't. Okay? Now Paul uses an example of this freedom in Christ here with the idea of eating all things. You see, the gospel of the New Testament covenant in Jesus Christ includes no ceremonial or dietary restrictions, whether it be from the law of Moses or from the Gentile tradition. You see, it wasn't just the Jews that wrestled with this whole thing of eating, it was the Gentiles as well. Because many of them came from very, very pagan backgrounds where they saw where a lot of this meat was offered to these idols, these false gods. 
So it wasn't just a Jewish issue, it was also a Gentile issue. And because of the idolatry and the immorality that was associated with their former religious backgrounds, they couldn't bring themselves to eat this meat because they're always associating it with all that negative, ugly stuff from the past. And they say, oh, we can't do this. So like Peter, they were spiritually weak. Remember Peter, the sheep, three times? God says, eat. He says, nothing unclean's ever touched my lips. God says, eat it. Third time, he says, if I say it's clean, it's clean, Peter, eat it. Thus Peter says, ah, oh, I can go to the Gentiles and I won't be unclean. How cool is that? Peter just had a growth lesson, didn't he? Some Christian Jews and Gentiles would eat vegetables only. Not because of health reasons, but because they didn't want to take any chance of eating any meat that they would have considered to be defiled by idols. Well, folks, a piece of wood can't defile anything. That's what Paul's saying. God says it's good food, it's good food. Now in verse 3, Paul gives a double injunction. First to the strong, he says, Let not him who eats regard with contempt him, the weak person, who does not eat. And that phrase, regard with contempt, contempt is one word. And it's a, it's a word that carries the idea of looking like that person, like they're absolutely worthless and of no value. It's, it's not just simply disrespect. It's not just, I can't stand being around that person. It's absolute, ooh, that person is just scum. That's the word that Paul's using here. It's the same type of word that was used by many Jews of that day where it said they would look with contempt upon the Gentiles. In fact, if you walk over into Gentile territory, you had to shake the dust off your feet when you came back in. You had to go through a special ceremonial cleansing process because you had been defiled by the Gentiles. Now, last time I looked, when you go from St. Albans to Palmyra, there's no you know, boundary in the air where this air is cleaner than this air. It doesn't work that way. But that's how the Jews looked at it. Absolute utter contempt for those people. And folks, it takes only one extremist to totally destroy a congregation. People who consider themselves spiritually superior to others. That will shut a church down and make it of no value very quickly. Paul's next injunction there is to the weak. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Another word, judge. Strong Greek verb that has a meaning of separating and isolating. It's the idea of finding a guilty person accused of something in a crime. The vegetarian says, that person really can't be saved. They don't really understand what's going on. It sounds like the Pharisees. Does Jesus really know who he's eating with? Neither does God even know this. That's the same type of idea there. In both cases, are they accepting each other? No, not at all. They're having utter disdain for each other. The strong member considers the weak member to be legalistic and self-righteous. Interesting. We often think that the person over here that eats all this is weak, but he's not. Okay? The weak member judges a strong member to be irresponsible and wicked. But the phrase, God has accepted him. It's not just him who eats. In the context, it's both. God has accepted both. He who eats freely and the one who doesn't. Now folks, just very simply, if God does not make an issue of such things, what right do we have to make issues of this? Why, why do we make us, what was it? Last night we were talking with someone, it's just cookies. Yeah, some cookies that were burnt. And the friend was getting all upset about the cookies being burnt. They wanted them done a certain way. And the other person said, it's just cookies. And that's become their operative phrase whenever one of them gets uptight about something that really isn't worth it. It's just cookies. I like that. It's just cookies. A friend of ours in South Dakota said, what difference does it make in eternity? It's just cookies. Makes a lot of sense to me. <coughs> if the strong and the weak have equal acceptance and fellowship with God, it's sinful arrogance. 
for either the weak or the strong not to accept each other. Secondly, we see that God assists us, or He helps us. Verse 4. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The second reason every Christian should accept every other Christian is that the Lord helps us all. We're all weak in the sense that everything good and righteous that we possess and do is a gift from God. It's never because of how great I am or how hard I work at something. But the reality is we still walk around in the flesh, don't we? And the whole issue of the flesh often tempts the liberated, the free believers, the, the strong believers, to think that the legalists are so rigid and so self-righteous, they sacrifice not only their own personal joy, but they limit their usefulness to God. On the other hand, that same way of thinking causes the legalist to believe that those who are liberated, those who are free in their thinking, who, who understand the freedom of Christ, to say, well, you're just too loose living. You're just self-centered. How can you serve God? You're doing whatever you want to do. And they're not getting each other. They're not understanding each other. And Paul confronts both with that question, who are you to judge the servant of another? It doesn't matter whether you're mature or immature. What right do you have to judge the servant of another, especially a fellow servant of, in the context, Jesus Christ? Do you know something? What you and I think about another Christian doesn't impact what God thinks about them in the least. Isn't that interesting? That ought to take the air out of some of our balloons. You think you're righteous? You think that... You have to do all these different things, and that person is wrong. Guess who really knows? God does. It's not going to change his opinion just because you think something. As far as matters of religious tradition and preference, every believer, strong or weak, is going to pass God's judgment not yours and mine. Because God doesn't take such things into account. It's not an issue with Him. We make a lot of issues that shouldn't be. And I challenge each one of us to look into God's Word and see if it really matters for eternity. If it matters for eternity, let's make an issue. But if it's just a difference of opinion, let it go. Let it go. Stand, to quote Yoda, he will. Because the Lord is able to make him stand. God's the one that makes us stand. Verses 5 through 9, we see also that God is our all. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it for the Lord. Remember, he's talking to Christians here. And he who eats, does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat. And, same thing, gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Talk about simple logic, but how many of us miss that? For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Whether you're strong or whether you're weak, a sincere believer feels free or not free to do things out of the same intent of the heart, the same motive. Please, the Lord. <coughs> okay? Sometimes the weak brother who abstains from certain things does so because he or she believes that's showing love to the Lord. So those of us who have freedom in Christ and we see that as legalism or whatever, we need to accept that person right where they are. God's Holy Spirit is in the business of changing lives. And for the person 
who has freedom to do various things that are not sin, they're doing it because they love the Lord for the glory of God. So whether one is spiritual or faithful has nothing to do with preferences. Being strong is not synonymous with being spiritual. Being weak is not the same as being carnal. He gives an example here dealing with the calendar. The certain religious significance and observance of certain days. He's talking to strong and weak believers, noting that the weak person says one day is more special than the other. The strong person says every day is created by God, they're all alike. Okay? How many of you celebrate Christmas? Yeah. Most all of us do. How many of you celebrate on December 25? How many of you celebrate on December 24? How many of you are still celebrating? <laughs> By the way, I think today's the last day of Ukrainian Orthodox Christmas, so feel free to celebrate today. You know something? Then there's the battle about, well, Jesus really wasn't born on December 25. You're just celebrating a pagan holiday. Get a life, folks. These individuals that make such a big deal about that. No, nobody knows. Do you know? <coughs> Do you have the birth certificate? <laughs> we have chosen to take a day and celebrate. And for some families, because they have families that live far away, they're going to celebrate in June. Can you really celebrate Christmas in June? We're not celebrating Christmas. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ came into this world. That's what we're celebrating. We get hung up on some things that really, we don't get it. We don't get it because God is our all. You see, for Jews, the Sabbath wasn't just the seventh day of the week, the day of rest and worship. But there were, that wasn't the only thing they were focusing on. They were focusing on all kinds of days that were respected and specially observed. You've, you've seen the uh, Chosen People Ministries. They've come here, I think, two different years. And they've shared about the different Jewish holidays and how much more meaningful they are now because of Jesus Christ. And they still celebrate those days because of the significance. It's not because they see it as making them more spiritual. For the fulfilled Jew, they understand the type, the symbolism is tied in with that. The weak Jewish Christians, however, felt like, well, if we don't celebrate this, we're not honoring God. And yet you visit with a Jew who is completed in Christ, and he understands this, and he says, we don't have to, but we choose to. Because there's incredible significance in our hearts and lives. The weak Gentile, on the other hand, he understood a lot of these days. Okay? Halloween. Okay? We don't touch Halloween. Okay? I'm not sure if I'm a weak or strong Christian in that area. But we don't touch Halloween because it is Satan's high holy day. And we know that. But you know, it's the Eve of All Saints Day. The Eve of All Saints Day. You can celebrate that. Okay? So there are some that come from a background that when they begin to understand certain things, they say, I'm not going to touch that because of what I used to do. Probably need to stay away from it then. Because we'll talk about that a little bit later on. He says, each man must be fully convinced in his own mind. Okay? There are some that's not an issue. But for me, it would be an issue. And I'm convinced in my own mind, don't touch it. And part of that has to do with my counseling of people who have been demonically oppressed. But for others, it's not a big deal. They're convinced in their own mind. It's not a big deal. It's just a day. Before God, there really is, it's not a matter of observance or non-observance. It's the intent. He says the weaker brother does it for the Lord. The stronger brother does it for the Lord. They both give thanks to God. Whether they eat, don't eat, celebrate the day, don't celebrate the day. Now, in matters that are not specifically commanded or forbidden scripture, it's always wrong to go against conscience. Okay? 
Did your mother ever tell you, if you've got a question, don't do it? Okay? If you've got any hesitancy, don't do it? It's good counsel. Because our conscience represents what we actually believe in our heart to be right. And if we go against that which we believe to be right, it becomes sin. It becomes sin. Even though that act or that practice in itself may not be sinful, if we have gone against our conscience, we have sinned. And if not, then why do we have guilt? It's also sinful to try to impose our own personal convictions on other people. Because we're trying to force them to go against their conscience. Okay? Be very careful. Because some things that we do that we're okay, but somebody else isn't okay with that, and we say, we need to enlighten you. You need to experience real freedom, and you've got to do thus and so. No, no, don't do that. You're trying to impose yourself on that person. That becomes sin. So Paul's giving kind of a twofold command here. He says, don't compromise your own conscience just to fit in or conform to some, what someone else is thinking. And don't try to lead someone else to compromise their conscience to be like you. You see, every judgment of conscience, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's about things evil in themselves or morally indifferent, is obligatory in such wise that he who acts against his conscience always sins. That's not me, that's Thomas Aquinas. I'll read it again to you. Thomas Aquinas states, Every judgment of conscience, be it right or wrong, be it about things evil in themselves or morally indifferent, is obligatory in such wise that he who acts against his conscience always sins. Now, as we've seen earlier, the greater responsibility lies on the weaker or the stronger brother? The stronger brother. Because the stronger brother or sister is usually better informed in the word, more mature in their understanding. And so Paul gives this next principle. He says, for not one of us lives for himself. Not one dies for himself, for if we live, we live for the Lord. What are we supposed to do? Live for the Lord. Very simple. Because neither the strong nor the weak is supposed to live for themselves. I've got my rules. I may be the weaker brother, but I know where I'm going because of my checklist. Really? Or, hey, I'm saved. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. No, you're to live for the Lord. You're not to live for yourself. You're to live for the Lord. What we do for other Christians yeah, we, we do it for them, but we really do it for the Lord. When we work even for a pagan, yes, we do it for them, but we do it for the Lord. That's what our lives are to be. Everything you and I do should be to please and to glorify Jesus Christ. <laughs> kind of reminds me about some of this unique theology that all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you're golden. Folks, you cannot be your Savior unless you're willing to make Him your Lord. We talked in Sunday school about the fact that we were slaves to sin and to Satan. And when you're saved, you're a slave to Jesus Christ. Okay? To say, I simply want a fire escape ticket. That's, I just want to get to heaven. That's all. No, folks. Do you want to make him your king? Do you want to say, be in charge of my life? That's making him Savior and Lord. He died not only to save us, but to own us. Not only to free us from sin, but to enslave us to himself. It's interesting, in the early church, the most common confession that was repeated the most was, Jesus is Lord. If you come and you want to be baptized and you want to become part of our church family as a member, I can guarantee you, I'm letting the cat out of the bag, Ron, 
But when you meet with the elders, the question you will hear, who is Jesus? I can just sit back and smile. Because I know Ron's going to ask the question. And if he doesn't, Chuck will. If he doesn't, Renee will. Who is Jesus? If he's just your Savior, we need to talk. Jesus is God. And he needs to be your Lord. The fourth reason, and guys, I had to alliterate here. I had to find another A. So I said, God is adjudicator of us all. What? Yeah, your pastor's desperate. I couldn't find anything else. He's judge. That's the adjudicator. He's the judge. Verses 10 through 12. But you, why do you judge your brother? For you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. The fourth reason Paul gives for every Christian accepting every other Christian is that the Lord alone will judge each believer. He is the adjudicator of every one of us, whether you're a strong Christian or whether you're a weak Christian. He is a judge. You know, it's a terrible thing for men and women to play God. To act like they know who's really spiritual and who's not. Folks, you and I don't know the heart. We can judge by outward actions, but we don't know the heart. We don't know everything that's going on in that person's life. And it's very inexcusable. <clears throat> it's totally inexcusable. Not very, totally inexcusable for God's own people to suggest that someone is lesser or greater by judging and despising one another. Well, the real Christians do this. Really? Only if God's Word says they do. <coughs> How many of you like country western music? I'll pray for you. <laughs> My mother loves country western music. I like some. Uh, I just really don't know where they get all those clothespins to cover their noses but, uh, and where they learn to swoon like they do. But that, that's okay. You'll forgive me because I like to pick on people. How many of you like opera? You'll pray for me, right? I, I like opera. Okay? How many of you like pop? I'm not talking about soda. I'm talking about pop music, okay? How many of you like rock and roll? Okay? Why wow, we've got a diverse church. What with Broadway music? Yeah, Broadway musicals. Let's, yeah. Anyway, we won't go there. We, we like all kinds of different things, don't we? How dare we judge someone else as if they're lesser because they don't like what we like or they like something that we don't like? Now, I grew up with country western music as well as southern gospel music because in southwest Kansas, there were two radio stations that we got. One played country and western, the other played western and country. <laughs> That's just kind of how it was. But God gave me a love for all kinds of music. But the, I just really have a struggle with country western music. I, I do realize that if you play the records backwards, that you get your wife back, the crops come in again, and it starts raining. <laughs> and the dog is resurrected. You know, that, that's, that's ridiculous. I'm attacking all the people in country west. Take it with a smile. But we do that same thing with each other on other issues, don't we? And shame on us when we do. Shame on us when we do. Because what does the world see? The world will see bickering and infighting. And what's Satan doing? And we grieve the Holy Spirit. Our testimony has been hindered. Someone, I think it was Joanne, said that Christians will often shoot their own wounded. Don't do it, folks. Don't do it. Our responsibility is not to judge. We don't need to usurp God's role. Jesus Christ is the only judge. 
We're not to despise, we're not to criticize, or in any way belittle our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, guess what? Every single one of us is going to have to give an account to God. Every single one of us. So accepting everyone as they are, without trying to change them to be like us, kind of goes back to what we're doing in Sunday school, doesn't it? Isn't that a wonderful expression of grace? I can be free to let you be the person God wants you to be. And if you're not quite there yet, I can trust Him to do the job. That's what He does. And if I'm not quite there yet, I know that you can trust God to do the job with me. Because we're all a work in progress. We're all on a spiritual journey that is uniquely ours. All who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. However, the one common factor in all of this that this spiritual journey is not about me. It's not about you. It's about each one of us becoming more and more like Jesus. You see, it's not my personal preferences, is that? It? It's am I reflecting Jesus? And don't you dare tell me that Jesus doesn't like country western music. You know, just because I don't, there is some that I do, and you guys know that. Don't you dare tell me that God doesn't love individuals who think differently than you and I might. If they've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I need to accept them. The way we find out how we're doing is not by comparing ourselves with each other, is it? Who do we compare ourselves with? Jesus. Jesus. So whether you are the weaker brother who... You, you still think you need that checklist with all the rules and regulations? <clears throat> or whether you're that stronger brother that understands that it's the heart of who you are, not what you do or what you look like. Whichever camp you find yourself in, accept each other. Accept each other. When we do that, the body of Christ looks like what he wants it to. A body that shows unity and harmony even in the midst of diversity. And think about it. If we do that, what kind of an impact we will have on the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm done now. And Andrew's ready to wake up. <laughs> right on. Let's have to pray together. Father, I am so thankful that you have made us unique. You have made us in such a way that you take each one of us right where we are and you develop us and you mature us as we surrender ourselves to you. So Father, if we are holding on to things from the past, thinking that makes us more acceptable in your eyes, help us to realize that's not what it's about. We need to be open to what you have for us. We need to be willing to make adjustments and changes so that we glorify Jesus. And Father, above all else, we want to accept one another, whether weak, whether strong, because you have accepted us in Christ Jesus. We stand because you hold us up. We all will have to give an account to you one day. Now, Father, continue to bless us as we live our lives for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.